Welcome to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Oral Video History Project. Today we're very, very fortunate to have past president, Dr. Douglas Kirkpatrick, to explain to you a little bit about his aspect in the college and so we can see a little bit about what Doug has given, given to all of us. Doug, welcome. Thank you, Ralph. Us. To begin with, we need to know a little bit about you, so let's start very basic. Okay. Where were you born? Washington, D.C. And why Washington, D.C.? Because my dad was in the service uh, in the Navy. And so you're a Navy brat. I'm a Navy brat. Lived in Alexandria for two years. And then? And then my dad uh, became uh, treasurer of Lehigh University, which is his alma mater, and so he moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And then following his treasurership at Lehigh, he became controller of University of Chicago. So then my formative years were growing up in Chicago. Where did you go to school in Chicago? Went to uh, University of Chicago High School, which was the private school by the, for the university. And when you graduated there, you went on to college, obviously. Did. Went to uh, Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Uh, and I met my bride there during her freshman week, uh, my sophomore week. And uh, we've been married now almost 51 years. So it must have been a good relationship. It was a good relationship. And she was had an academic scholarship to go to Northwestern and, and not sure why she chose Cornell over Northwestern. <laughs> but it was a good one. But it worked better for you. It was great for me. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. When did you decide you wanted to become a physician? Very early on. I uh, had the opportunity, since I was on the campus of the University of Chicago Medical Center, to work in the x-ray department at age 14, filing x-rays. And during that time, you can actually walk the halls in the um, upper decks above the operating room and actually look into the operating rooms and see surgical procedures. And then I got asked to uh, assist in doing some animal surgery, uh, cat neurosurgery actually, uh, when I was 14. And I, I just became immediately interested in being a surgeon uh, after that experience at 14. And then when you graduated, where did you go to school? So then I, I went to University of Iowa Med School and, um, first you went to undergraduate school, I assume. Well, I went to Cornell College first yeah. for four years, and then I had uh, four years at the University of Iowa. And uh, Joni got her physical therapy certification uh, while I was getting my MD at the University of Iowa. Bill Keedle uh, was chair at that time, and he <clears throat> recognized me and said, uh, Doug, I think you'd be a good obstetrician and I'd like you to come back to University of Iowa residency program. And uh, I always rem had a fond memory of Bill Keitel. He was a great person. He was. Uh, I liked him very yeah. much too. Yeah. And then you went on? So then I did a rotating internship at Sacramento Medical Center <clears throat> and um, then had two years at Shepherd Air Force Base uh, down in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, and again, I was fortunate. I was assigned to be a general medical officer, but I, um, I had a commander who was interested in family medicine, and so he took me out of the, uh, the GMO status and put me in with the uh, sort of a new family practice, taking care of women, uh, the dependents, and then uh, the OBGYNs knew I was interested in OB, and so then I started taking OB call at night with their supervision. And, uh, and then they actually uh, let me assist with surgeries. And so I really had a lot of experience before then I went to, before I went to Michigan for my residency. And you were at the University of Michigan? I was. And who was the chair at that time? J.R. Wilson, one of our past presidents of ACOG. And also a very well-known medical educator. Yeah. And, and my, my true mentor at Michigan was uh, George Morley. Uh, also a past president of the college, and a uh, marvelous uh, human being and, and a great surgeon. Can you identify, or maybe you can't, one specific episode that solidified your desire to become an OBGYN? Uh, 
actually it was at University of Iowa um, during my very first rotation as a senior medical student on obstetrics. I, I just fell in love with the specialty and um, it was actual it was actually Dr. Uh, Glass, uh, he was on, uh, he was a second year resident at that time, and he uh, supervised my first vaginal delivery, and I, I just was totally in love with the specialty after that. Now, Pri prior to that, I just thought I was going to be a surgeon, but I said, no, I'm going to be an obstetrician now. <laughs> now, at the University of Michigan, yeah. when you finished the program, there, right. where did you go from there? Well, I, I moved actually from Ann Arbor to Denver in 1975, and I've been there ever since. And what sort of uh, arrangement did you have in Denver? Well, I joined two other doctors for the first year in a private practice, and um, it, it, it was apparent after the first year that they wanted to uh, consolidate their two offices to one, and so I chose to leave and start my own solo practice, uh, which I did for the next uh, 32 years. And my lovely wife, uh, Joni, uh, became my office manager during that whole time. And so she ran the, the books and allowed me to practice medicine. Obviously, during that period of time, you couldn't have been on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 <laughs> days a year. How did you manage that? Well, initially, actually, I was, uh, Ralph, and, and I uh, did get, uh, I did have another solo doctor we would share uh, informally would take some time off, but it, it took a while before I actually had a uh, formal call relationship where I was on call every other weekend. So there were there were two or three years there where I was really on call 24-7. Did you have any special areas of interest or did you just, were you what we <laughs> euphemistically refer to as a generalist? I, I think I was uh, known as a better obstetrician but interestingly, in my later life, I felt I was a better surgical gynecologist. Um, but I think I was known as, as a, a good high-risk obstetrician initially. Then when did you first get interested in ACOG? Um, I had a mentor in Colorado, uh, Dr. Houston Alexander. And we had a brand new Colorado section of ACOG in the early 1980s. and. It was Dr. Alexander, who was vice chair of the district, that came to me and said, Doug, I would like you to be the next vice chair of the Colorado section. And, and he was just an incredible individual and just um, one of those people who tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'd also like to get you an academic appointment at the University of Colorado because you're teaching my residents here at, at St. Joe's Hospital. And so uh, he did a couple of marvelous things for me, and, and uh, I just was initially uh, attracted to ACOG for what it was doing for women. And so it's, it's just been a progression of a 30-year history uh, with the college as an officer. What positions have you held in the college? Well, I, I was vice chair and chair of the Colorado section, and uh, I was at this concomitantly when I was chair of the Colorado section, I was president of the Colorado OBGYN Society, which was a separate entity which no longer exists. And then um, following <clears throat> my section activities, I became a district officer. And I was a, uh, the secretary for the district, vice chair for the district, and district chair. And I have to say that uh, the thing that um, stood out when I was district chair was uh, our ability as a college to form the Central America section under my chairmanship. That, that was truly uh, the most rewarding thing I, I can think of during that whole time period. And then you moved on nationally. I moved on nationally <laughs> and I became a vice president of the college uh, 2004 to 2005. Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to be president of the college, to be honest with you, and I, I tested the water with the vice presidency, and I was glad that position was there for one year, and then, uh, and then I said, okay, I, I think I want to do this, and then, I, uh, then I, I went for it. I recall talking to you in the Denver <laughs> airport about that. Did you? At one time, I'm yeah. not sure continuing to be a, yeah. a candidate. Yeah. Now, during your presidency, yeah. You initiated a program which 
in the college now is uh, looked at as probably one of our pillars, and that was patient safety. Right. Tell me about your experience with patient safety and why you felt that was so important. Um, I, I felt we were doing a great job with patient safety and the hospital environment. We had just, we had our bases covered. We had labor and delivery set up, we had the operating room set up, but nobody had addressed patient safety in an office setting. And I, th I thought there was a real void, and as a private practitioner, I felt we really needed this um, for not myself, but all the fellows of the college. And so why did you pick and choose that? I mean, there well, had to be some reason. I, I, uh, it's hard to say. I, I sat down, I'll, have to, I'll be honest with you, I sat down with uh, Hal Lawrence and Lucia Devenier, um before I, uh, as I was just being nominated as president-elect, and we just sort of talked about a whole bunch of different topics, and, and we talked about professional liability, because that's another um, pet passion of mine, is the Copic 3Rs program. And, uh, and I just have to say that patient safety just came up amongst the three of us as a, as a real potential hot button uh, topic. I think it was a, our, our mini committee opinion that that was going to be a, a, a good way to go and I, I, I agreed with that. Now one of the things that's happened of course is that yeah. patient safety is now one of the critical issues right. of the college. Right. Where do you think we need to go now with patient safety? Well, I think we're doing a, a great job with our scope project, <coughs> which is to have um, OBGYN certified uh, by the college to have a, a certification of excellence to perform um, office patient sa or office uh, surgery, also have a high level of um, interaction between our office staff in the front and the back. Uh, do mock drills, basically uh, operate in a safe environment. We're finding that the um, the qualifications for scope is a very high bar, and so we we need to try to uh, get some more carrots out there to get more physicians uh, interested in this. But I, what I see happening is the professional liability companies uh, in some states are starting to help pay for the scope certification. So I can see that, that that's huge because it's not inexpensive for physicians to um, be certified by scope. But if we take a bit of that financial barrier away, uh, they we may get more members. Do you think this actually improves their practice? Absolutely. I, 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 I can just see it in my own practice, uh, Ralph, because I've um, instituted mock drills and checklists and uh, we've not had uh, any significant adverse events in our practice and we have standardization. We've taken away variance among the physicians with preoperative medications. When I first presented the um, concept of a checklist and having the um, same preoperative medications for each operative procedure, whether it was an Esure, Novasure, whatever they were doing, uh, it was interesting. I had six doctors doing six different things and the office was confused as to who did what and so we standardized all of this and I, I think we're in a much safer environment now because of that. Where do you think the college should go next in patient safety? Well I think that the, the biggest step would be then to sell this concept to professional liability carriers so that if um, your scope certified you then would uh, be offered a discount in your professional liability premium. And we're just testing the water, but I think professional liability carriers don't appreciate uh, what scope certified means yet, and so I think th they're not ready to jump on board. But I think once we do that, then we'll have an avalanche of fellows applying for the program if they know that they can get a significant discount from their professional liability carrier by being uh, scope certified, uh, I think it would make all the difference in the world. If you could make any improvements in the current scope program, what would you do? Uh, we have to market it. We have to somehow um, 
advertise this to, to fellows. Uh, and, and I think the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle I see with scope is there's a lot of emphasis placed on the OBGYN sort of doing the whole process. And I think the key is you have to identify one or two people in your office who can really uh, help develop the policies and procedure manuals that you need and the interaction with your EMR interface. And so you have to have a designation of a couple of smart people in the office to really run this program and the physician can then supervise. But I think for a physician to undertake the scope, unless they're a solo practitioner, uh, is, is daunting right now. You um, have obviously been a leader in this through all the things that we're, we're doing. Are there any other specialties that have the same type of program as uh, scope? I, it's a great question. I, and I don't know the answer. I think uh, the College of Surgeons is, uh, is promoting this, but I, I'm, I think they're the only ones that I know of. We're certainly the leaders uh, in, in this patient safety arena, I believe. Do you think this will ultimately become required in all specialties of medicine? Uh, it, it's a good question. I think in, in terms of outpatient patient safety, I can't, I, I think it's going to be universal, but it, it will take hold in the specialties where you're doing outpatient surgery in your office setting because that's the highest risk area. And so it's a natural for OBGYNs to be certified because we're doing uh, procedures that we might normally take to an outpatient surgery center and have an anesthesiologist. Uh, administer anesthesia, and now the OBGYN is administering, quote, their own anesthesia, plus they're doing the procedure. Now, the latest concept is, is that there are uh, groups of anesthesiologists that are coming in now to the office setting and providing anesthesia and billing separately for their services, and probably that is the way we ought to go, because that's, that's a, another level of safety to take away the um, burden on the OBGYN to monitor the anesthetic level of that patient during a procedure. You mentioned and talked about patient safety in the SCOPE program, but earlier you also mentioned about your interest in uh, professional liability. Right, right. How do you see the two interrelated? Well, I, I think they're the same coin, and uh, as we have uh, improved patient safety, our professional liability um, issues will be markedly uh, reduced, especially as we uh, take away variance and have standardization of uh, protocols, guidelines. I mean, you know, this is, the college is doing a great job right now. I mean, Jim Martin's um, hypertensive protocols that'll be on every labor and delivery will just be a incredible boon. And, and that will reduce physicians' uh, liability by just having a, a following um, prescriptive guidelines. One of the comments that we hear back from some of our fellows on this is that, but you're forcing me to practice cookbook medicine. Mm -hmm. Right. How do you answer that question? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is the complaint about guidelines and the, um, it, it's hard for the uh, individ, individual physician who is especially working in a rural community setting to probably embrace the idea of having to follow a guideline when they've they've practiced in a way that has worked for them for years. They'll be the last people we're going to reach. Um, but 50% of physicians, 50% of OBGYNs are now hospital employed. Uh, the, many of them are now under large health groups like HCA, Kaiser, and so they um, they have standardized protocols and guidelines to follow. But I, I think reaching the, uh, that individual practitioner uh, uh, is going to be the difficult one. I, I, don't, I don't see that happening quickly, uh, but hopefully if they keep up with the literature they'll realize uh, the good outcomes that are, that are being um, uh, you know, basically happening with the uh, uh, following various procedures. And 
Doug, you've been a real leader in patient safety and yeah. also bringing the college into a lot more activity yeah. and professional liability. Right. But I want to explore another aspect of yours. Okay. Tell me about your mountain climbing. <laughs> As I understand, you've climbed all the peaks in Colorado. I have. And uh, it's interesting you, you ask that because I've been asked by the uh, past presidents to present that subject tonight. So I'm going to present my passion on mountain climbing. And uh, it involved a um, period of 16 years uh, with two women, actually, in, in different families. And we uh, successfully climbed all of Colorado's 14ers. There are 54 of them. And so we did this over a period of time. And then we... Uh, and they're all higher than 14,000? They're all higher than 14,000. And we also had the opportunity to go out to Washington State and do Mount Rainier which is a difficult ice climb. And then we ended up uh, in 2006 on, in Kilimanjaro, and that was our last high altitude, which is 19,400. But uh, it, was, it was a great experience. And uh, What got you interested in mountain climbing? <laughs> that, that's one of those things that's hard to describe. Uh, interestingly, there were two other families back in the 70s who had preteen children who were backpacking. And, and they en enlisted our family, uh, and we had similar age children to them, uh, into backpacking. And then they said, why don't we start just hiking up some easy 14ers with our families? And so we started doing that. We would we'd take everybody up these easier 14ers. And um, I just, I think I enjoyed the uh, journey of the hike, but it was the incredible views from the top that were just spectacular. But I, I sort of enjoyed getting ready for the mountains physically, and uh, and then the opportunity to deal with other people who had the exact same passion I did, and we would, uh, you know, be very good communicators about how to climb the mountain in terms of navigational ability and so forth. But as far as what actually just clicked on it, it was hard to say what what just stimulated that first interest but boy it just took hold and i my youngest daughter is actually a better rock climber than i am and she's 33 now and she is on her way to finishing the 14ers and has pulled me along to do a second round with her <laughs> after i finished all of them so it's she called uh, <laughs> father daughter bondi Father-daughter bonding. We, At 14,000 <laughs> feet. At 14,000, which has been great. Do you recommend mountain climbing as a uh, good sport for uh, OBGYNs? I think it's a great sport for OBGYNs. It's absolutely, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a test on multiple levels. I mean, it's a physical, mental, and uh, it, it, you know, a lot of survival skills. You have, and, and I... I also equate this to patient safety because part of um, what you have to do when you're mountain climbing is you have to have checklists and you have to have all that equipment or you're in trouble <laughs> when you're on top of the mountain and when you're going on a day hike you have to have your headlamps and your extra food and a space blanket uh, in case you get stuck overnight on a mountain. So uh, a lot of logistical things that go into a uh, uh, checklist. But then the other thing that, that's part of the patient safety thing is um, being very aware of your surroundings in terms of um, how physically fit the other climbers are that you're in your group with and communicating and don't ever leave anybody behind <laughs> is, is one of the rules. And uh, the other thing is is that you, uh, uh, you need to um, uh, be able to really read weather patterns very well. Uh, if you can get in trouble on top of these mountains, if you get caught on lightning, and uh, that's not a good place to be. And so, there's, and you have to learn how to use uh, compass and you know, maps and the whole deal. Do you think that your interest in climbing has had a major influence on your interest in patient safety? I, yeah, it's an interesting comment. I, I suspect your 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 perception's good. And, and because I, we, we were safe uh, for 30 years of climbing and we had guides when we thought it was appropriate to do so and we did not expose ourselves unnecessarily. And we all, always said on a bad weather day or there was too much snow on a mountain, 
that the mountain would always be there for another day. And, and so we came back and we did it two and three times till we got it right. But that, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, perception on your part. Do you think that you'll ever be interested in climbing Mount Everest? No. Or Annapurna or no. any of those large, no. large mountains? No, I'm, I'm absolutely good because I, I think, uh, you know, climbing to almost 20,000 feet without oxygen was just fine and I, and I was in great shape when I did it. And uh, no, I think I'm, uh, I'm just fine climbing 14ers with my youngest daughter. <laughs> How long did it take you to climb Kilimanjaro? Uh, that was a seven day climb. And it was uh, with two guides. We had one from Boulder and one from Durban, South Africa, who actually knew each other from previous outward bound experiences. And they guided eight of us all over the age of 60 up Kilimanjaro uh, and the Swahili word for acclimatization is puli 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 which is slowly 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 <laughs> so that's what we did for seven days very slowly it's a non-technical climb it's all about acclimating let me take you back to the college then okay you've been very active in the college what has been your greatest experience in ACOG other than becoming president okay I think being a CDC chair, that was marvelous. And actually during, uh, for, my, for the ACM, doing the college advisory council that year, I did a whole program on professional liability. And I remember how much I enjoyed doing that. John Queenan was uh, on that program. I can't remember the others, but uh, I think, that being a CDC chair was the next best experience, I would say. Then on the opposite end, what has been your most disappointing experience? Oh, um, some of the committees that I was on were not um, seemingly as relevant to what I wanted to, you know, where I thought we were going. But, but I appreciated having that all the committee experience in preparation for what I ultimately did. But uh, some of the committees just weren't relevant to my personal needs. If you had one thing that you could change in ACOG today, what would it be? I think uh, what would I what would I love to have happen? A great infusion of money. <laughs> in Obviously, we all love a lot of money, <laughs> but <laughs> a great you know I and I get you know what I would love actually is. For the um, and, and it's not the college; it's generational. And it, it, what I would really like is for the young fellows to appreciate the value of networking, like we have gotten here at this ACM. Obviously, the young physicians who were here are experiencing that, but I have young partners at home that I, I will never get here to the ACM because they don't value networking, and so. That to me is one of the key uh, things about uh, leadership in the college and, and that is that interaction of seeing how everybody works together. And uh, I don't know how to do that with this generation. It's frustrating because we had one meeting a year, excuse me, one meeting a month. Our Colorado section brought in famous speakers from all over the country every month. And we've done that for 60 years. And last year, there was a survey that the young physicians did not want to come to dinner meetings anymore, and so we went from a meeting every month to two meetings a year. And I just had two women from the University of Colorado come up to me as residents, and they want to stay in Denver. One has already got a practice figured out, and they say, how can I get involved with the OBGYN community? And I, and I, and because they remember the great lectures we had when they were medical students. And, and I said, well, we can get you the Congressional Leadership Confer Conference in D.C., but, you know, we've gone in a reverse order in our Colorado Section educational project. And so I, I, I was a little disappointed I couldn't offer her something better. Uh, so I, I think that's the thing that I would love to see happen. And, and, I, and I would like to just get the young physicians involved <clears throat> by being uh, visible with the senior physicians and having, and I guess mentorship is what I'm talking about. 
is really getting the senior doctors to pair up with the younger physicians and kind of pull them along. Doug, thank you very much for sharing yourself and your ideas with us today. Good. You've given us things to think about Good. and you've obviously been a very important part of the college and I value our friendship tremendously. Yes, so I, again, thank you very, very much. Thank you.